Well, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Thrive. Incredibly excited, as always, to have this opportunity to share with you. Man, today is going to be an incredible day. Shout out to everybody that's watching us live. Listen, if you're watching a replay of this, we do this live every Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, our chat community is a vibe. It's a vibe. As a matter of fact, if you're in the chat right now, put vibe in the chat. Vibe, vibe, vibe. But whenever you're watching this, we're grateful that you're watching this and incredibly excited to have you as a part of this community. Ugh. You cannot experience transformation in isolation. You cannot experience transformation in isolation. I want you to catch this. <laughs> Your success requires a squad. We all need squad goals. And uh, man, this community is a vibe. And, you know, I love my Thrive family and so excited to be with you on the last Wednesday in June. Where did the year go? Where did the year go, guys? It's listen, but even if you don't, I feel like we've had a I've had a pretty good first six months. I'm, I'm grateful to God for this for this first six. It, they've been really good. Uh, but I'm going for really great for the last six. If that's you, put me too in the chat. Um, first six have been really, like really, really good. I'm going for really great these next six months, man. And I hope you're doing the same. Uh, I got, I got something that can help you actually do that. And, um, man, I want you to be a part of a tribe. There, there are four types of people that exist in the world. Somebody get ready to write this down. Cause, and listen, when I teach you something, take it and teach it. If you're a teacher and you add value to other people, teach it. I have people hit me all the time like, hey, can I use this that you taught when I'm teaching? Teach it. So I'm giving you four things. All right. Here, here. There are four types of people that exist in this world. Write this down, guys. This is a biblical. These are biblical animal metaphors. Here it is. They're sheep. They're wolves. They're goats. They're lions. And I'll have time to break all four of those down. But you just you think about it. You can probably make the connection. What type of people are sheep kind of. They can be docile, a bit naive, um, not assertive, not aggressive, you know, good people, but don't necessarily live good lives. Sheep primarily just get used for their wool. So you got sheep. And, you know, I think when people see that, that imagery in the Bible, they think that's the only imagery in the Bible. Like sheep isn't the only imagery in the Bible. There's snakes in the Bible. There's goats in the Bible. There's wolves in the Bible. Lions. Jesus is referred to as a lion. So anyway, here's the point. You got sheep and you got wolves, ravenous and deceptive and aggressive and selfish and self-serving, cannot be trusted, right? They're predatory. They prey on people. They prey on people. And some wolves prey on people consciously. Then other wolves prey on people unconsciously. They don't even know. It's just their nature. They just being a wolf. Then you got goats. Goats, who have sheep like tendencies, but are not sheep. Uh, they have person. They have a personality type that can be stubborn and they can be docile at times or goats can be aggressive at times. Groats are not very discerning. They kind of eat what's what what is put in front of them. Sheep are more um, discerning about what they eat. Goats are not. And so goats will eat that, which is good. And goats will eat gossip. Oof, right? And, and then you got lions. And they're assertive and they're aggressive and they're go getters and they're passionate. They're called the king of the jungle and they're not even the biggest animal in the jungle. They're called the king of the jungle and they're not even the strongest animal in the jungle. They're called the king of the jungle. They're not even the fastest animal in the jungle. Lions are kings of the jungle, not just because of their acumen, but because of their attitude. And so whenever you're trying to help people, you got to know there are four types of people. There are wolves who they don't want help. Then there are goats who kind of confuse about the help they want. There are sheep that you got to lead the right way. And then there's a small group that are lions. So we've got something for lions and lions go to something called Daniel's Den. And that is, in my opinion, the best personal and professional development program out there, guys. Uh, it's really, I believe, if you're going to reach your potential, then there you got to master four areas, spiritual intelligence, emotional, relational, 
and leadership. Those are the four areas you got to master. If you don't master those areas, you won't reach your potential. And if you don't reach your potential, there's some things in this earth you won't do. Daniel's Den is open right now, officially. You can go to danielsden.com. If you're a lion, that's where you need to be. I'm telling you right now. All right. So listen, let's let's wrap up this series I'm in on Thrive on Wednesdays called um, I'm Gifted. So we've been talking a lot about gifts last um the last several weeks, we've been trying to do a deep dive. Some of you have asked me about a spiritual gifts assessment. We're going to put that assessment in the description of this video. So it'll be in the description, not the chat, the description. So in the description of this video will be a link to that assessment. But today I want to talk about deploying your gifts. It's one thing to discover your gifts. It's another thing to de develop your gifts, but it's another thing to deploy. How do you unleash your gifts? A refusal to deploy your gifts is the equivalent of Dave having a slingshot and not throwing the stone. Did you hear what I just said? I said an unwillingness to deploy your gifts is the equivalent of having David slingshot and uh, David having his slingshot and David not throwing the stone. Somebody put in the chat right now, sling it. God did not give David the, the access to that slingshot, access to those stones and the acumen or ability to be able to use it the way David could use it and David not use it. So it, does, it doesn't matter how good David was with the with the stone. He's got to throw it. He's got to sling it. And whatever gift God's given you, let's say God's given me a teaching gift. Well, my teaching gift doesn't address the, the, the Goliaths in the land, the Goliaths in culture, unless I sling it. I can't keep the teaching gift in the slingshot. I got to teach. <laughs> Thrive exists because I want to use the rock that's in my slingshot. And so many of you might be in different stages. Some of you might be in the stage where you're like, Dr. Darius, I'm discovering. If you're discovering that spiritual gifts assessment is for you, some of you or some of you are discovering, some of you are rediscovering. Or you might be in level two. Level two is you're developing. Based on the lessons that I taught last, last Wednesday, you're developing, okay? And so that's, that's incredibly important. But then some of you are in a season, and I don't think you, you ever get out of a season of developing, right? You should always be developing your gifts. Here's what I want to say, though. You have to get to, there is some development that doesn't take place without deployment. Ah, there's some education that only comes through experience. There are some things that this is what the Bible says, even about Jesus. It says, and he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. See, some of you don't realize, watch this, that some of your experiences that seem irrelevant are actually education. Are oh, we going there tonight? Tonight. We going all the way there tonight. Yep. All gas, no brakes tonight. Let's go. Here it is. I said some experiences that many of you are having in life are experiences that you find a bit confusing because they're experiences that seem to be unexpected. They seem to be unrelated to the role you're playing. They seem to be unnecessary for the route you're trying to take in life. You're like, man, what is this? God, why am I here? Why am I working here? Why? Let me see. Let me see. Where, where are my honest people who've ever asked that question? God, why am I here? I'm going to see how real y'all going to be at Thrive. I want to see, is this audience authentic here at Thrive? God, why am I here? <laughs> why am I here? Why am I living here? Why am I working here? Watch this. Why am I worshiping here? I I'm going to see. Uh, let me see if y'all can handle this. Why am I here in this relationship? Uh-oh. <laughs> <sighs> Am I here because I'm comfortable? Am I here because my value, my sense, my value, my sense of self is inconsistent with the value that I inherently have being made in the image of God? Has the enemy blinded me to the reality of who I actually am? Because the Bible says he's the God of this world. And one of the weapons that he uses is the weapon of blindness, right? The God of this world has blinded those so that they can't see the glorious light of the gospel, right? So I think he not only blinds you from seeing Jesus, but he 
he knows if he blinds you from seeing Jesus, he blinds you from seeing you because you can't get a proper perception of your value without having a proper perception of the one that created you. This is what the Bible says. It is he, God, that has made us, not we ourselves. And so I can't accurately assess how valuable I am without having an understanding of the creator and what the creator says about me. Because nobody knows more about me than the creator says about me. And let me just pause and preach to you on a Wednesday night or whenever you are watching this. Let me just pause right now and preach this to you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. What does that mean? It means that God strategically and meticulously orchestrated your existence, including your personality and your competencies. And David said that about himself. Now, watch this. Now, what uninformed, some uninformed, uninformed, arrogant and zealous people of faith would say, if you said the same thing, they'll call you arrogant. But David said it. That's not arrogance. But that's what uninformed. This is what I found. I found sometimes that the most uninformed people are the people who are the most outspoken people. Here's a proverb. It is better to be thought a fool than to open my mouth and confirm it. Oh, oh. That's a proverb, guys. <laughs> that's not arrogance. That's awareness. That's awareness. So why, why am I here? That's what we're talking about, right? But God uses some experiences as education. He's like, I'm trying to teach you something. So this experience might be unrelated to what I'm going to do in your life. But what you're going to learn from this experience is necessary for your assignment. That might be why you're having some of the experiences that you're having. And some of the experiences are cultivating in, in you two things that you need to deploy your gifts. Somebody get ready to write these down, type these in the chat. The first thing is character. Character. Write that in the chat, guys. Character. If I'm going to deploy my gifts... It means that God has to cultivate in me the kind of character. Like, here's what we teach people. I teach a little bit of this in Daniel's Den, definitely in my other coaching programs. Here it is. It's the be, do, have philosophy. What's the think, be, do, have philosophy, which is based on this biblical proverb, right? As a man thinketh, so is he. So my thinking affects my being. Am I right or am I right? Because if it's, if, it's if it's in the Bible, it's right. The Bible, the most reliable source of information on the on the planet. So am I right? Or am I right? That's what the book says, right? As a man thinketh, so is he. That's the Bible, right? OK, that's Proverbs. Then Paul says in Romans chapter 12, don't be conformed. Y'all remember Clado? Is it called Clado or Plato? Y'all know what I'm talking about, though, because, you know, you had some because some of you as old as me. <laughs> somebody put in the chat leave me alone if you over 40 put leave me alone put that in the chat no no if you 40 and older because some of y'all be like i'm not over 40 uh pastor darius i'm i'm 40 you in the club with all of us you 40 and over put leave me alone <laughs> you know what play-doh or clay-doh is you know that's how that's how bored we were growing up. We had to play with clay. <laughs> Woo! We did not have these phones and we didn't have iPads. It was no Netflix. Watch this. Some of y'all, come on now. Let me see. Some of y'all, you grew up like me. When you was seven, eight, nine, ten, there wasn't an internet. There wasn't even AOL dial up. It wasn't even AOL. There was no, you got mail. There was no email. No FaceTime. That's why in the summer when our parents would get tired of us, they just say, just go outside. It wasn't nothing to do. <laughs> they just sent us outside. Ain't nothing out there, mama. <laughs> There's nothing out there. 
Some of y'all need to, need to pause right now. You need to press that share button and you need to send this to somebody. Whoever God's putting on your heart right now because their rock is still in their slingshot. You Come on now. You have been trying to get them to see the value of what God's giving them. But they're sitting on their gifts. They're sitting on their talents. They're talking about they're going to write it and they're never writing it. They're talking about they're going to start it and they're never starting it. You need to send this to them. Some of you, some of you ignoring those promptings. And when you're ignoring promptings from the Holy Spirit, this is when, when the Holy Spirit prompts you to do something, put somebody on your mind, say, call them, text them, reach out to them, go over there. Right. I think sometimes we are so imprisoned to our ego that we cannot operate in obedience. We are so concerned about how we will look if we are wrong, that how we look if we if we're wrong about the prompting overrides the impact that will have that will be had on others if we're right about the prompting. That's ego. And I'm getting ready in a minute to get ready to share with you the spirit in which you need to deploy your gifts so that you're doing it with humility and not arrogance, right? You're doing it with confidence, Godfidence, not arrogance. That way you're taking into consideration the possibility that it might be wrong or misinterpreted, but you rather be wrong and misinterpreted than not to act upon an impulse that you feel like God has put in your heart. I'm not going to get into specifics here, but I know very specifically, and I'm not saying this call would have uh, changed this course of action. As a matter of fact, I, I don't know if it would or not. In all likelihood, it probably would not have, but it would have released this person from some regret. So there's a person that uh, that we know, my family knows, that took their own life. And there's someone that I know who, when they found out uh, before they found out that person had taken their own life, they were like, man, I got to call such and such. I got to call such and such. I got to call such and such. And they never called. And then when they found out that that person took their life, they said, I was supposed to call such and such. Now, does that mean them making that call would have prevented that person from doing that? Not necessarily. Is there a possibility? Yes, we don't know. But here's the issue. Whether it would have prevented the person from doing it or not, what it would have done is, is that it would have relieved the other person from the regret and the guilt that they carry because at least they're able to say, I did everything I knew to do. I obeyed those promptings. And so I know that seems like a random tangent there, but if the Holy Spirit prompts you to do something, then I want to encourage you to do it. Here's the point. We're going back to character because that's what I'm talking about here. It's the think, be, do have philosophy. Y'all still following me? Okay. So don't be conformed. Play though. Clay though. Whichever one it is, don't be conformed. So he's saying, don't let the world, the world's value systems, right? And some people think the world is stuff like movies or the mall. I'm not even going to bother that. No, it's the value systems of the world. So don't let the world's value systems do you like play doh or clay doh. Don't let it conform you. He says, but be transformed how? By the renewing of your mind. So your thinking affects your being, right? But your being affects your doing because your doing flows out of your being. You will always behave in a way that is consistent with how you see yourself. So your thinking affects your being, your being affects your doing, right? Faith without works is dead. That's my, my works, the corresponding action that lines up with my beliefs. Faith without works is dead. Being alone. It's like I got faith is just dead, though. Being alone. So my thinking affects my being, my being affects my doing, my doing affects my having. So there are some people that are upset at you about what you have, but they didn't do what you did. And they didn't become who you became because they didn't think like you thought. Watch this. Some people are projecting their anger at you when their anger is really a consequence of their own lack of evolution. Uh, did you hear what I just said? Yeah. Th th and that is, uh, and they should be looking at you as a instrument for inspiration. 
That's why God exposes you to the success of others to inspire you not to have what not to get what he has for them, but to get what he has for you. So he inspires, he exposes you to the success of others to inspire you to pursue what he has for you. But when you pervert that exposure, when you are immature, not just spiritually, emotionally, but there's a con connection between the two. Because when spirituality is practiced biblically, not traditionally, because most, the mo many people practice a compartmentalized spirituality. So it's like you can be saved and, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit and mean. So that, that's not even, that, that might be traditional. That's not even biblical. Fruit of spirits, kindness, gentleness. So it means you hadn't allowed the Holy Spirit to govern your soul, the emotional realm. So many people compartmentalize it, etc. That, that, that's what they do. Here's the point, though, guys. Here's the point. When you're emotionally immature, you become jealous of what you're supposed to be inspired by. And all of this comes back to this one thing of character. Becoming the kind of person that throws the slingshot. I hadn't thrown my slingshot yet. I need to practice some more. No, you hadn't become the kind of person yet that throws it. I gotta, I'm going to write my book. You won't write it until you, become the kinds of per, until you become the person that stops talking about writing it and writing it. I'm going to get myself, I got I to gotta get myself, my doctor told me my numbers are up. I know my body's a temple. I know I can't control everything that happened with it, but I want to do my part to steward it well. That's, that's good stewardship. God didn't give me this body just to just ignore the numbers and what the doctor's saying, et cetera. I'm, I'm going to do, not until you become the, become the kind of person that takes action. And the average person doesn't take action. But if you're watching Thrive, you're, you're allergic to average. The average person only watches Sunday periodically. But some of you are such a lion that if I put something on here every day and I'm getting ready to. I'm getting ready to. Soon, there's going to be something on here every day, sometimes twice a day. Some of you are such lions. You're like, if you put something on here every day, I'm getting it. He who hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled because God will fill me and fill you to the level of our hunger. Somebody put some fire in the chat tonight. So character. What does it mean? And when I say character, I'm talking about developing a character trait of courage. Courage is not the absence of fear, guys. Courage. Listen to me. Courage is the, uh, the willingness to take action in spite of fear. And I don't know who this is for, but I'm getting ready to put this. I want you to put this in the chat so that you can encourage and inspire those around you. Drop this in the chat right now. Put this in the chat, guys. Do it anyway. I'm scared. Do it anyway. It might not work. Do it anyway. They might laugh at me. Do it anyway. I might be embarrassed. Do it anyway. What if it goes wrong? Do it anyway, because what if it goes right? So if I'm going to deploy my gifts, I got to have character. Here's the second thing. I'm almost done. Is this good? Because if not, we just spent, we just really kind of wasted time over the past several weeks with this teaching if we aren't going to do anything with it. You know, if you just keep, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use that imagery, but if you just keep acquiring spiritual information and it never moves into implementation, then you limit your transformation and you become what the Bible calls a Pharisee. And that's a person that's ever learning, never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Now, when I say Pharisee, I mean, I don't mean technically like in the in the historical uh, sense 
and use of the word, but I mean the spirit of that, like the attitude of that. If it, it's a person that's kind of filled with knowledge and information that is not produced transformation in their life and is not producing transformation in the lives of others. This is what Jesus actually said to Pharisees. Jesus said to them, you are supposed to be helping other individuals come into the kingdom of God. Listen to what Jesus said, but you actually in the way. I feel the Holy Spirit prompting and pushing me right here. Somebody just put in the chat, get out the way. He told Jesus told religious leaders, he said, you are in the way. He said, you are the reason some people are not entering into experiencing the reality of the rule and the reign and the government of God. They cannot experience life the king's way because you are in the way. And he said, it's because you puffed up. You just, you know, you know, things you aren't using. He's saying to them, y'all just want to talk. He said, you just want to sit around and just talk. Don't y'all see that in our modern culture? People, they just talking in the comments, just talking. We talked about this and when we when we studied what Paul said earlier, when he said, um, study yourself to be quiet and to mind your own business. God's giving you some business to take care of. And when you're obsessed with your business, you will not be so interested in others. Somebody just say this. You're not talking to anybody in Thrive, but just put, just, you know, just say it just in case, just in case, just in case. Somebody just put it in the chat, get some business. Yes, that's a word from the Lord. <laughs> Character. All right, now here's the second thing. I'm going to wrap up. Competence. Dr. Darius, what do I mean? Here is what I've seen. This is what I see Paul addressing in the book of Corinthians, specifically 1 Corinthians 14, and that's, that's a, a good chapter for some of you to read. Um, when I say competence, I'm referring to something that I see a bit frequently, specifically in charismatic circles. This is what I see or continue, people who even wouldn't call themselves charismatics, but even if they would just call themselves continuationist, right? I would be, with my pneumatology, the way I kind of line up, I'm like a charismatic with a seatbelt. You know what I mean? Like spiritual, but not spooky. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? So anyway, here's the point. Um, so my pneumatology is continuationist. It means I believe in the, the perpetuity of the spiritual gifts. Uh, I think that's New Testament. So I see that in my exegesis and I see that in my own experience uh, in my personal life and also in our church. I have benefited from the perpetuity of those gifts. Uh, my life has been so radically. I talked about this last week. So radically. It has so so much value has been added to my life by spiritual gifts, such as people who like didn't quench the spirit and prophetic words and words of knowledge, just like spot on kind of nobody would know this, but God kind of situations, not that general situation, you know, that general stuff where it's 300 people in the room. It's like somebody in here is going through something. Yeah, it's three. Of, yeah, somebody. One, uh, if it's three of us, one of us going through something. Well, I'm talking about like that, that kind of specificity, like where, you know, it's God. Man, we, I remember one time we was looking for a house and we were about to give up. And um, I mean, weren't even going to move. We just like just get and like my wife got a message from somebody early the next morning. It's like, I feel like God told me to talk to y'all about a house. You, you're supposed to move and da 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 da. You're supposed to do this. You I was like, oh, my gosh. And we didn't even know this person like that. So anyway, this is what I see. I see people confusing, watch this, confusing their possession of a gift with the performance with the gift. In other words, that they assume that just because they have the gift, they know the right way to use it. That's like saying, just because I have a slingshot, I know the right way to throw the rock. You can have the rock, that's the gift, 
but I need competence, mentorship. Um, somebody had messaged me earlier. They said, Dr. Darius, I, um, you know, I don't need coaching. I need mentorship. It's like what I'm saying to myself, if uh, maybe you mean you don't need a life coach, but everybody need coaching. So you might say, you know, you don't need a life coach. You don't want that. But there cannot be transformation without coaching. A mentor. So a lot of times when people say they want a mentor, they want a teacher because the teacher can transmit information. But a mentor or a coach, they should facilitate transportation. A mentor should have a degree of authority, expertise and insight in a specific area. And as a result of that, that person can help um, uh, pr provide you with insight and with guidance and with development in that specific area. Right. But when you're dealing with a coach, a coach is not necessarily a specialist in an area. A coach is a specialist in change. And this is why a coach can coach people that have uh, that are doing things that he doesn't necessarily do. Jesus is the most effective coach in human history. We see him doing tons and tons and tons of coaching. And so uh, here's the point that I'm making. Without some kind of guidance, and Paul is going to give us some here in 1 Corinthians, there's, there won't be the proper utilization of like the gifts. You won't throw the rock right. And this is what I see. It's like people with prophetic gift and it's like, whoo, you throwing that rock wrong. And I'm not saying everybody has to throw the rock the same way, but Paul very clearly lays out here in 1 Corinthians 14, based on some of the gifts that you have, that there is a way these gifts should be utilized. I want you to see here in 1 Corinthians 14, he's dealing with a congregation that has an obsession with glossolalia. They have an obsession with speaking in other tongues. And Paul's like, listen, guys, it's not that that gift isn't important. He's like, you need the rock. But he's like, the way you're throwing that gift is not the best way to throw that gift. This is what he says. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians um, 14, verse 12. He says, so it is with you since you are eager for gifts of the spirit. Try and excel. Try to excel in those that build up the church. So he's like, y'all are obsessed with a gift that builds up you. Come on. And not that builds up the church. I'm not even going to deal with this. So Paul is actually teaching against some of the things that many of us have experienced in charismatic circles. Paul is teaching against spiritual gift classism. What's classism? One ranked higher than the other. Paul actually teaches against that. And many of us know that glossolalia and the gift of tongues has been put on a pedestal by certain traditions and it's not Pauline. So I'm not going to get into a wrestling match with people about that. I, I, I don't care. Um, I care more about what Paul says about it than what I say about it or somebody else says about it. Right. Because the Bible has more authority to speak to these issues than any of us do. And I think any objective interpretation of what Paul is talking about here in First Corinthians 14 and First Corinthians 12, you will see the very thing he's dealing with with them is spiritual gift classism. People feeling like my gift is bigger, better and bigger than yours. And he is trying to debunk that. He's trying to deconstruct that. He's trying to dismantle that. And we can find ourselves reconstructing what he's trying to deconstruct. He's like, yo, the prophetic gifting is not more important than the gift of helps. It's just more seen, but it is not more important. Y'all better come get me here. The working of miracles is not more important than the leadership gift. It's more celebrated. A leadership gift won't pack a stadium. A gift of miracles will pack a stadium. But just because it's more popular doesn't mean it's more necessary. Y'all better come get me here. I have a preaching gift and my teaching gift is more transformation. It's not inspiration. Now, am I inspirational? I hope so, because you can't be transformational without inspiration. Right. But if somebody has a spiritual gift of encouragement, who don't want to be encouraged? So people with encouragement gifts tend to be more popular. This is why we're amazed at what God has done through our teaching ministry here, because people don't usually come in droves like the way y'all do to get taught. But you lions. Somebody put in that chat, feed me. Don't play with me, Pastor Darius. Don't play with me, feed me. Feed me, I need more than milk. Feed me, 
I need more than gravy. Feed me. I need some meat. I'm trying to raise kids, Pastor Darius. I'm trying to figure out this next season of my life. I'm trying to figure out, should I stay in school? I'm trying to figure out, should I get married? I'm trying to figure out, should I break up? I'm trying to figure out, should I start this business? I'm trying to figure out, should I leave my job? Leave my job. Don't just tell me everything's going to be all right. I need to hear that, but tell me more than that. So Paul is talking against this. He's trying to deconstruct this. And he says, verse 13, for this reason, anyone who prays in a tongue should, should pray that they interpret what they say. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What shall I do? I will pray with the spirit. I also pray in my understanding. Both. He says, otherwise, you, otherwise, when you're praising God, he says, I will sing with my spirit and I'll also sing with my understanding. Glossalea. And I'll, uh, an unintelligible tongue and I'll, and I'll sing with an intelligible tongue. So here he is not talking about singing in other foreign languages. So Glossalea had two manifestations in the Bible. The first of which is God's supernatural in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. God supernaturally empowered the believers. Y'all, I got to go because y'all tired of this. Y'all tired of this, ain't you? You don't you don't want to learn nothing today. You, you just you want to hear Mary had a little lamb fleece was white as snow. You don't want to go deep in the word of God. Okay, so on the day of Pentecost, what people spoke in was not glossalea. It was not, Paul said, though I speak with the tongue of men and angels, it was not a heavenly unintelligible language. On the day of Pentecost, this is Acts chapter 2. We're going to read it, then you can read it, and you know you can come to your own conclusion. We're not going to argue about it because it's a secondary issue. It's not a primary issue. Here's the thing. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit supernaturally empowered the disciples to carry out the commission that Jesus gave them in Matthew 28, which is to take the nation, to take the gospel to all ethnos, to all people groups, to disciple nations. They could not do that if there's a language barrier. So if you look, actually look at Acts chapter two, I want you to read it. Don't just rehearse to me what somebody you love told you. I want you to read it. Now, I'm, talk, I'm talking spicy tonight, huh? I'm t- <laughs> I'm t- I love you, and I'm, I'm, uh, and I'm trying to push you to this next level, all right? Uh, somebody say, push me. Put that, push me. Don't play with me. I came here, Pastor Darius, for you to push me. Verse 4, Acts 2, says, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with in, in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them, all right? One translation says, as the spirit gives, spirit gives utterance. Now check this out. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Wait a minute. Each one heard their own language being spoken. Each one heard their own language. Be- so there are people here in Jerusalem from every nation, and they're hearing their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all those who are speaking Galileans? Some of y'all need to pause this and uh, look at Acts. Because I want you to read this with me. I'm not making this up. Aren't all those who are speaking Galileans? How is it then that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthidians and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea, Judea and Cappadocia and uh, Pontus and Asia and Egypt and parts of Libya and visitors from Rome, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonderful works of God in our own tongues. That's a fact, family. That is just a that is just objective exegesis without an agenda it is just read the bible without the lens that were given to me by tradition and just read what it says here there are it is it is they were supernaturally endowed to speak literally other languages and those people heard the gospel proclaimed in their language and that's what the holy spirit does it it empowers you to make the gospel translatable that's one kind of tongue. But then Paul talks about another tongue here. And, we, and part of us, he, he talks about it in 1 Corinthians 12. But he also talks about it here in 1 Corinthians 14, which is tongues of men and angels. Tongues, he says, well, my understanding is unfruitful. And so here's the point. They're obsessed with this in 1 Corinthians. And Paul's like, guys, listen. He say, um, verse 16, he says, if you praise in God in the spirit, how can someone else who's put in the position of an inquirer say amen in your thanksgiving since they don't know what you're saying? 
He says in verse 18, I thank God. He said, I speak in tongues more than all of you. So he's not anti-tongues. He says, but in the church, I'd rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 in a tongue. And then he says, stop thinking like children. Gosh, y'all don't want Paul smoke. <laughs> Paul tells them, stop thinking like children. He says, when it comes to evil, be infants, but be in your thinking, be adults. So here's my question. And I'll, I'll wrap up with this. My question is, what is Paul trying to get across here? Paul's trying to articulate the importance of utilizing our gifts in a way that that edify others and not just appease those who just simply want to be intoxicated with church experiences. You know, how sometimes you say, I just I want to have some church. Paul's like, it's not edifying people, though. So he says, so if you've got a prophetic gifting, how can you use it in a way that makes it understandable? Like that you, we can have prophetic gifting and it not be yea, they, hey. That we can have teaching gifting and we can use examples and analogies that 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 actually edify people. And that makes sense that that we can talk Christian concepts and not use Christianese that that. We can deploy these gifts in a way where God can use them to reach people that need them the most. And many times in church settings, we just using our gifts on each other as exercises to free us from boredom, as opposed to being a blessing to those that actually need it. I want you to throw your rock. God wants you to throw your rock. But man, we want you to throw it the right way. The world needs it. In Jesus name, were you blessed tonight, challenged tonight, helped tonight? <laughs> well, if so, man, I want to I want to put before you a biblical principle. And it's in Galatians six. It's, it says, let him that is taught in the word communicate to those that teacheth in all good things that if a ministry is adding value to you spiritually, then as as you are receiving that value, as an expression of your appreciation, listen to me, for what God is doing through that ministry. You say, Lord, as an expression of my appreciation, I sow back into this field. The sowing imagery is New Testament, is Old Testament imagery, but, but it, Paul uses it specifically in New Testament to refer to this. It's not used exclusively in the New Testament for this, but Paul uses it specifically for uh, this whole idea of giving. And he's saying, listen, he even told the people at Corinth, he said, man, if, if a ministry is sowing into you spiritual things, then they, it should reap from you carnal things, meaning that you should give those things to that ministry that enable that ministry to reach more people. You know what I'm saying? To, to expand its reach. And I believe our expression of appreciation for the contribution that God um, makes into our lives through certain ministries is what actually helps us experience the manifestation of that word in our life. See, some of us, have notes from words that have manifested. And the question we got to ask is why? Sometimes it's because of God's timing. We weren't doing anything wrong. Other times it's because our tactics. It's meaning that we're trying to mock God. Galatians says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He says, you can't mock God. He says, hey, so you might take notes on a message and receive a message and not express appreciation through reciprocation. He says, but you won't you won't you won't have manifestation of that word in your life. So I'm not saying we buy blessings. I'm not saying you got to give to be blessed. What I am saying is that there's a biblical principle here at work that I think God has put in place uh, to prosper his ministries so that they can continue to do more work and to prosper his people. So uh, you might not have a prosperity theology. I don't. But you cannot have a biblical theology if within that biblical theology, there is not a theology of prospering. Right. And so what's the difference? It's sometimes in prosperity theology, then prospering is the goal. In biblical theology, prospering is the means. Like God's goal in just to prosper us. God's goal is to use us. And in using us, he prospers us so that we can be used. And this is a biblical principle. It's a principle I practice. It's a principle that is 
position my family and I to really walk in the manifestation of things that um, we dreamed about to see the faithfulness of God. I was telling somebody the other day, I think all the blessing that we've seen in our business and on our companies, uh, my wife has a truck on the road right now, trucking company, and it's hard to find drivers. It's hard to get trucks. It's hard to do all of that, but it's just the favor of God, favor of God. She found favor person gave her, got us, uh, access to get a truck favor God found the right driver favor God loads loads backed up waiting to get picked up it's see that's that's favor and you you, you can't buy that but you can demonstrate that you're a person that can be trusted with that by sowing seed and so uh, I want to encourage you to do that. Whenever you're watching this, bless you. We appreciate you. Love you so much. I look forward to seeing so many of you in Daniel's Den, which is probably one of my most favorite things that I do. And uh, if not, I'll see you next week right here on Thrive. We're going into July next week. So we're doing something called Summer Revival. Summer Revival. So we're going to give you some classics, some throwbacks from way back. And um, y'all know I take me a little... You know, me and me and my wife, we you know, we take we 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 do our little grown and sexy. We we married. We twenty one years in the game, so we you know, we go to a little beach or something. You know, we do a little something something together. So we we're gonna give you uh some some throwbacks from way back next week, and uh, give you a couple of classics, and then uh, man, we're gonna come back and God's gonna do some incredible things. I love you. God bless you. Until next week. Don't sink. Don't just survive. Thrive. Well, listen, thank you for watching Thrive. I want you to make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss any of our teachings. And remember, you can watch me live at Thrive every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Take care. I'll see you soon.